Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I could not be more delighted than to participate in a conversation with two of my favorite people. Like many of you, I wake up every morning with Heather Cox Richardson. <laughs> Sorry, Heather. Of course, I'm talking about her daily newsletter, Letters from an American. I always find something relevant to one of the films, one of the many films I'm working on at that particular moment. She leads me down astonishing but fruitful rabbit holes. Her new book, Democracy Awakening, Notes on the State of America, is grounded in her understanding of the past and equally inspired by people around the country who each day work to improve and protect our democracy. Jeff Rosen, one of our country's leading constitutional scholars, oversees an extraordinary museum that is committed to the values that define us and challenge us as a people. The National Constitution Center is a unique place that exists at the doorstep of our founding in Philadelphia and on our computers and devices wherever we are. Jeff's new book, The Pursuit of Happiness, How Classical Writers on Virtue Inspired the Lives of the Founders and Defined America, challenges us to look beyond happiness as something material, just another possession, to something deeper. How do we improve? How do we evolve as individuals and as a people? I came to the festival to join Walter Isaacson to discuss our new film, Leonardo da Vinci, the first non-American topic we've ever undertaken, which will happen in a couple of hours. But I was also thrilled to be asked to participate in this conversation because I'm completing a six-part, 12 and a half hour film on the history of the American Revolution. And who better to talk to on that than Heather and Jeff? I should also add that I'm in the middle of a multi-year project on reconstruction called Emancipation to Exodus, for which Heather, recently sat for a wonderful, wonderful, deep and, and for me, extraordinarily uh, helpful interview. Uh, so let's start, of course, at the beginning, and the beginning is, of course, of America. Um, to both of you, what was the American Revolution? Was it a war fought over noble values like self-governance and liberty, or was it a, for, a war fought over Indian land, taxation, representation, and contentious issues associated with property, including, of course, slavery? Or was it all of the above? How should we think of our founding? Let's start with Jeff. All of the above. Uh, can you just describe the opening words for the new American Revolution documentary? And you put it so beautifully that the revolution was both a fight for property rights against the British and land against the Indians and much more, but all within the context of a debate about the American idea. And it's so important to remember what the American idea was and what people were fighting for. And it's all in that famous sentence of the Declaration. Equality, natural rights, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, government by consent, that was what united the competing sides, and it was all a debate about what those ideas meant. Liberty, from the very beginning, Thomas Jefferson was divided against himself. Was it liberty for white men whose rights could be traced back to the ancient mists of Saxon England, which was the initial justification for the revolution? Or when that failed and the British rejected that, was it a fight for universal rights of all humankind. And when Jefferson broadened his gaze to that broader idea, he allowed previously excluded groups like uh, blacks and women and so many more to invoke the universalist ideal of the Declaration to fight for equality. And then the dispute about the meaning of equality, which ultimately led to the Civil War, was once again a battle pitting Jefferson against himself. And then there's Government by consent or democracy. Everyone agrees that people have to be able to govern themselves, but which people? We the people of the United States as a whole or we the people of the several states? And it was that dispute, dating back to the debate between Hamilton and Jefferson, that defined our early constitutional debates, led to the growth of our political parties, and ultimately led to the Civil War. 
And then there's the pursuit of happiness, which is the subject I just had the incredible privilege of learning about for this new book, and how meaningful it was for me to rediscover by, by reading the ancient moral philosophy that inspired the founders, that for the founders, happiness was not a quest for feeling good but being good, not the pursuit of pleasure but the pursuit of virtue. And that, the, and that virtue meant, can you put it better than anyone else, self-mastery, character improvement, self-improvement, ultimately being a lifelong learner, always being open to new ideas, to improving yourself every day so that you could be your best self and serve others. And if there was one ideal that everyone agreed on throughout the revolution and throughout American history, it was that idea which belonged to each individual. And it's so inspiring to see revolutionary freedom, freedom fighters during the revolution itself, uh, to, to, to see black um, uh, heroes invoking the ideals of the Declaration, to see Frederick Douglass invoking the ideal of self-reliance, to, to take it all the way up to King on the Mall, to see previously excluded groups invoking this unalienable right to develop your faculties and be a lifelong learner. You know, uh, Jeff, we were talking earlier this morning, uh, Heather wasn't there, I don't think, but I have, and you, and you, you grabbed a whole bunch of stuff from the Declaration, the aspirational data. I, I've been drawn, as I was telling you, to that all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable. And Jefferson is, in a way, saying, look, up until this moment, all of human history has been, people have suffered under authoritarian rule and have been willing to suffer that. And, and somehow we're going to create something different. We're going to create a, um, a, a new thing in which you're not just a bunch of superstitious peasants. You're not subjects, but you're this new idea of citizens. And yet the tension in the United States, Heather, has always been between the ideals of citizenship and individual responsibility and some of the great things that are implied by the lifelong learning of pursuit of happiness. And various groups, oligarchs at times you refer to, moneyed interests who have in some ways uh, arrested or uh, been able to capture the, the sort of the natural um, uh, development of the ideas that the founders set. You know, I think it's important to remember that the, when the, the founders talked about the revolution, they weren't talking about the war. That was the Revolutionary War. They were talking about the way people's minds changed and that the revolution took place before the war broke out. And what that revolution was is exactly what you identify. The, the realization among ordinary Americans that they did not have to live as subjects that they had the right of self-determination and they had the right to have a say in their government. The rest of it, how that was going to play out, the different interests, the fact that there was land grabs behind this and real issues over who would actually be included in that in that moment. Certainly indigenous Americans weren't included, uh, women weren't included, most black Americans weren't included. We could go on uh, to, to include lots of people in, the, in what became the United States. But that idea that we are all created equal and we have a right to a say in our government is revolutionary. It's revolutionary today even, the idea that we are all equal and have an equal right to have a say in our government. Tell that to most of the nations on earth. You know, that's, that is why the American Revolution to me is still so incredibly inspiring. And why Benjamin Rush said it's still going on. The American War, he said, is over, but the American Revolution is still going on. So our it's still going on in 2024. In 20, that's what I mean. 2024. The the. But I want to stay back there for a second because we have our guy, Thomas Jefferson, to whom it falls to write the body of this first draft, amended magnificently by Benjamin Franklin. I, um, 
uh, Jefferson had said, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable. And Franklin goes in and says, no, 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 self-evident, although these are not self-evident truths. As somebody in a film we made on Franklin said, this is a lawyer's dodge. You say it's self-evident <laughs> when, it, when it's clearly not self-evident. Nobody has that experience. But he, the idea that all men are created equal, this is a man who owned hundreds of human beings in his lifetime. So I wanted to kind of stay on slavery and, and talk about Historians have referred to slavery as our original sin, the institution uh, we couldn't quit even as we preach to the world our superiority by promoting these universal natural rights. But perhaps that simplifies everything because it suggests that were it not for slavery, somehow everything would be okay. I think the point is, and please correct me, is that slavery and racism were integrated into every part of colonial and, there, and thereafter American life. It's there in our founding documents, even when it's not mentioned. And it's there when slavery was abolished in the North and later during the Civil War. As John J. Chapman, who is a 19th century critic and poet and speaker wrote, and we quoted in our series on the history of the American Civil War back in, in 1990, says, there was never a moment in our history when slavery was not a sleeping serpent. It lay coiled under the table during the deliberations of the Constitutional Convention. Owing to the cotton gin, it was more than half awake. Thereafter, slavery was on everyone's mind, though not always on his tongue. It's an amazing quote. Jeff, you focus on the founders and how steep they were in the classics, and yet you explain and they understand the hypocrisy of the very idea of human perfection when you own other human beings and often fathered people who were then enslaved. How do you understand this contradiction and how did the founders attempt to reconcile and I would say probably more important since it's not reconciled, rationalize it? Mm. They did not try to reconcile, but through amazing uh, capacity for self-deception, they did try to rationalize it. And it was so striking to me to see that when it came to justifying, they didn't even try. There's a remarkable quotation that I found from Patrick Henry, uh, which uh, just before he gives his give me liberty or give me death speech, saying that white men will never be Britain's slaves. And he said, is it not amazing that I myself, who own, uh, who, who believe that slavery violates natural rights and I'm fighting a revolution against it, myself own slaves, I will not justify it, I won't attempt to, it's simple avarice I can't do with the inconvenience of living without slavery. It, isn't that amazing? You gasp, and it's that moment of, ah, they got it. Avarice, greed, these are the classical sins. Jefferson and Henry and all the enslavers from Virginia spend all their time reading this classical philosophy. They believe that frugality and industry and sincerity are virtues, and ambition and avarice and indolence are sins, and they recognize it's their own greed and laziness and selfishness that makes them addicted to the lifestyle that slavery makes possible. Jefferson seems more shocking on close examination than less. It's very striking that the man who uh, in, uh, spent his whole life denouncing the, the wrongness of passing on debts to future generations uh, refused to free his own children uh, during his lifetime, although he kept a promise that he made to Sally Hemings in Paris and freed uh, two of his children on his death, he freed none of the rest of his enslaved population, and they were sold, uh, mothers torn from children to pay his own debts. What's also really shocking about Jefferson was the degree of his personal racism. I have an extraordinary experience of seeing the great poet Phyllis Wheatley, the first published black poet, who read the same classical philosophy that the founders did and wrote these spectacular poems of virtuous self-mastery that are claimed by George Washington for her genius. She goes to London and she becomes what Professor Henry Louis Gates calls the Oprah Winfrey of her time. She's a celebrity, she's acclaimed by all except for Thomas Jefferson. And in his notes on the state of Virginia, he shockingly says that uh, Wheatley's poetry is beneath contempt because black people are intellectually inferior to white people and black poets can't be good poets. It's a really unfortunate turn for the great apostle of human reason and liberty. 
And yet, even Jefferson did not try to justify slavery um, as a moral enterprise. And it wasn't until Jefferson's heirs leading up to the Civil War, in particular John Calhoun, who developed theories of scientific racism, uh, insisting on blacks' inferiority, and then used that to say that they weren't entitled to the promises of the Declaration, and that the Declaration itself was wrong to promise equality to all human beings. So that is a significant fact and reality about the founding generations. All the enslavers from Virginia said slavery was a violation of the Declaration, was morally wrong, and eventually should be abolished. Some were far better than others in terms of living their principles. Washington did free uh, his own enslaved population on his wife's death and made provisions for their education. Franklin, of course, became an abolitionist and grew and changed. Um, and yet, they all knew that it was their own avarice and hypocrisy that led them to rely on this wicked system. So, so, so Jefferson also towards the end of his life is temporizing too. He acknowledges you don't like it. It's like holding a wolf by the ears. You don't like it, but you don't dare let go. And, there's, and he buys more Italian statuary and more French wine and tries to pretend to pay no attention. I mean, he, he, I mean Washington has a plantation. It's clearly a plantation. We know where the labor's coming from. Monticello is a disguised sort of, you know, neoclassical place in which you invent a dumbwaiter so you can sort of pretend like it's not going on. And yet, even today, in your column, which was a reprint of something celebrating Maine's, celebrating and agonizing over Maine's entrance, there's a little bit that you gave back to Thomas Jefferson, too. Oh, I never give anything to Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, I, you know, he's just like, I'm, I'm so sorry, and I should have asked if we're being taped, but isn't he like the original weenie? Yeah. You know? I, I mean, let's call it like it is. He, he temporized, I mean, it, anyway, we could, I could go on at such length, we would all sit here, too, we were corpses about Thomas Jefferson, but... Um, but the question of enslavement in the Constitu I'm sorry, in the Declaration of Independence among the founders, very different actually than the Constitution, but I think it's, it is absolutely embedded. And crucially, it's, it is, I think, the reason that the founders, so many of whom were enslavers, could imagine a world of equality because they didn't have to say, hey, we have to figure out how to construct a new nation with indigenous Americans and with all these immigrants. You know, you could travel from the East Coast into Ohio in as early as the, in, in, as late as the early 1800s and not hear a word of English. You know, they didn't have to worry about how to incorporate all of these people into a multicultural sort of a government. Instead, they could say, those of us who are white men with property we are all equal, and crucially, we're equal to our brethren in the old country. And that was the vision, I think, that they embraced. And the idea that inequality was central to equality from the very beginning is something that I think is deeply embedded in our DNA. But what they didn't recognize, although John Adams writes a letter about it and says, hey, you know, these ideas are spreading to places we didn't expect them to. Um, <laughs> Uh, is, is that concept that we are all equal only requires us to expand that concept. And, you know, in the 1970s, there was an, a movement, a legal movement, briefly. You're a lawyer, right? So you know about this. I just pretend to be one, but yes. Okay. Well, the whole, the, the whole idea that natural resources should be treated as people and should have standing to argue in court you know, nowadays, most, nowadays a lot of people have forgotten that, but that article, Should Trees Have Standing, is, was a really big deal about how we might be able to redress the problems that were happening with the globe. So I'm not suggesting necessarily now how far that those limits should go, but that idea that people are equal is one that could spread at least to human beings. There Audience, seems everyone. to be a vagueness in the language and declaration and even in the preamble to the Constitution, there's just mechanical sort of operating manual in the Constitution stuff. Um, but there is pursuit of happiness. It isn't happiness, it's pursuit, as if this could be something that, that it's in order to form a more perfect union. Um, do you 
extend that, or let me let me let me rephrase a little bit and just say that in your book, how the South won the Civil War, which I agree with you, um, the victors did not win. Uh, you trace the ideology of the South through the end of Reconstruction, Jim Crow, and the myth of Western individualism as we um, uh, exert manifest destiny. Your new book continues this lineage, I think, I hope you would agree, a uniquely American lineage to today, including Charlottesville and January 6th. Is this all about race, or is race a conscious tactic that is used to support an existing power structure? So as we talk about this inequality or the possibilities of, of a more diverse thing that would have co could have come out of the United States, still could come out of the United States, is it, is it just defaulting to that? Well, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push that because there is almost a cottage industry in American history arguing about whether the issues in our country are about class or race. Right. And I'm a classic Libra, and I say it's both. <laughs> you know, that because of the way we had enslavement and then the, the, the marriage of the rise of federal taxes and uh, it, during the Civil War, at about the same time that black men got the right to vote, we got the idea that you know rather than turning against people based on race, you could turn against them based on class. And that's the argument that we see after the establishment of the Department of Justice in 1870, that in 1871, former Confederates start to say, well, we actually don't object to people being part of our society based on their skin color, what we object is to have poor people because they're voting for things that are going to cost tax dollars, and those tax dollars can only come from the people who have property, and those people are all white. And this is a redistribution of wealth from white people to black people. And this is, as they said in 1871, a form of socialism. Uh, and that's where we actually get the American real form, real fear of socialism is as far back as 1871. You're not going to get the Bolshevik Revolution until 1917. That being said, I would like to suggest in a radical way today that one of the things that we make a mistake about in American history is that we focus on race and class and gender as opposed to power. And instead of seeing the world as a system in which there are very few people who want to take power, most of us just want to get along, right? Um, we just want to put food on the table and, you know, eat M&Ms. <laughs> Maybe I'm speaking personally. Um, uh, but there are a few people who want power. And the question to me in a society, not just in the United States, although that's what I study, is how does one garner power? And in the United States, because of our history, the obvious place to go is to race and gender. And that's the other thing that's really big right now that we don't talk enough about. But that you, you need to find, to garner power, you need to find the pressure points of a society. And ours, because of our history of enslavement and because of our history of misogyny, it's much easier to use those pressure points, which is how you can end up, I would argue, with a person of color using race issues to garner power in their own society. I don't know, that's the way I think about I, it. I, uh, you know, I, I find this so compelling and I think that having made a film on Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, women were asked to sort of put aside the, the movement that began in, in 1848 for equality to support abolition and uh, did, and then were stunned when the vote would be extended to black men and not to them, and spoke in very racist terms ab about them. Exactly. And I think, I think we do get down to power. And I'd, I'd like, Jeff, if you wanted to respond to what Heather said, because we do seem to be in parallel tracks that perhaps only the Libra can uh, help us understand today. But, but this, this notion of, of you know, having race and class and gender on one side, but really having power which is, if you want to frame it better. Can I ask a better. question, too, on this? Because what, what uh, Jeff has done in this book is to unpack what it means for the pursuit of happiness. And uh, it's really interesting. And do you read all those languages? Or did you read them in translations? All English. No, I don't read okay. the classics at all. I'm always impressed by people who read the classics in any form. Um, but wasn't the original Lockean phrase, life, liberty, property? Yeah. So we've got the, re the replacement of property with the pursuit of happiness. Um, and, and, and it's a mathematical constant. Uh, yeah, we were talking about yeah. this this morning, uh, too, about uh, what, you know, there was a little bit of luck in not having property. So why did Jefferson replace uh, life, liberty, and property, which is in John Locke's second treatise, 
with uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Well, there's a technical reason, and then there's an incredibly important uh, moral reason. The technical reason is that property is not an unalienable right. Remember, this is all coming from social contract well, that's cool. theory. And that's when we move from the state of nature to civil society, we alienate or surrender certain rights in order to get greater security and safety of the rights we retained. You alienate property, you trade it, you give to government the right to regulate it. But you can't alienate the pursuit of happiness because the pursuit of happiness is the right and duty to follow the dictates of our conscience and reason. And reason is core to who we are as human beings. And I can't alienate to Ken or to Heather or to anyone the power to control my thoughts because I can't entirely control them myself. They're the product of my reason, which is unalienable. And that was an Enlightenment era idea. I can deliberate about them. I can resist my immediate impulses so that I can uh, tame my powers of my unreasonable passions with my reason and therefore serve my long-term interests. And that's the definition of virtue. And these creatures of the Enlightenment are so shiningly confident in the ability of reason to moderate our passions so that we can achieve that virtuous self-mastery that for them, the pursuit of happiness was not some unusual phrase that Jefferson plucked out of uh, nowhere. It's everywhere. And now I'm going to tell you about this amazing reading project that led me to resurrect the, uh, Jefferson's understanding of the pursuit of happiness. And then I'll relate it to the questions of power and politics today. So during COVID, I just noticed two synchronicities that set me down this incredibly productive rabbit hole. Ben Franklin, when he was a kid, uh, when he was in his 20s, resolves to achieve moral perfection. <laughs> he makes a list of 13 virtues that he wants to practice every day, temperance, prudence, and so forth, uh, and puts an X mark every night where he fell short of the virtue. I tried this with a friend through a Hebrew version of the Franklin system. It's incredibly depressing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every single night, temperance, no, X, prudence, miss, no. <laughs> but like Franklin, I felt like I was better for having tried. That that's kind of daily. And wasn't stuff. there one, an extra one that her friend suggested that he'd forgotten, which was humility? That was the toughest one to, he imagined the book, Humility by Benjamin Franklin. Yeah. <laughs> So I knew about this Franklin system, but I, during COVID, I saw that he picked as his motto for the project this line from uh, Cicero, from a book I'd never heard of, the Tusculan Disputations, without virtue, happiness cannot be. Then a few weeks later, I was at the Boar's Head Inn in Charlottesville, Virginia, on the UVA campus, which is a big Jefferson place, and there was a list of 12 virtues that Jefferson drafted for his daughters. They were almost identical to Franklin's, and he picked as his motto, whenever anyone would ask him when he was old, what's the definition of happiness, a passage from this book by Cicero, The Tusculan Disputations, that said, he who is tranquil in soul, who's used his reason to moderate his passions, who avoids undue exuberance or wanton exultation, he is the tranquil person of whom we're in quest, he's the happy man. I thought, okay, I've got to read Cicero. I've had this you know, wonderful education. I just saw one of my college classmates who's here and we were expressing gratitude for our great teachers. I studied literature and history and political philosophy, but never Cicero and the great works of moral philosophy that inspire the founders. And then I found this reading list that Jefferson would send to kids who were going to law school or anyone who asked, how should I be an educated person? And it's a very rigorous schedule. You gotta get up before sunrise, read the moral philosophy in the morning, watch the sunrise, po po political philosophy in the late morning, you're allowed some history in the afternoon and astronomy, literature in the evening, then to bed 12 hours a day, every day. In the section on ethics or natural religion, I saw Cicero's Tusculan Disputations, Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, Epictetus, all these classical Greek and Roman moral philosophers, and then Enlightenment philosophers like Locke, and Hutchison and Bolingbroke and Keynes. And I thought, okay, I've, this is a gap in my education. I should do this. So during COVID, I'd wake up early, as Jefferson said, read from the moral philosophy, watch the sunrise. And then I found myself doing something really weird, which was writing sonnets to sum up the wisdom of the moral philosophy. And this seemed incredibly strange until I learned that a lot of people in the founding era did the same thing. The great Phyllis Wheatley, Alexander Hamilton, John Quincy Adams would write sun sonnets and then walk along the Potomac while he's in the White House after reading Cicero. There's something about the wisdom that makes you want to kind of sum it up. And I did this for a year, and what I learned just came as a complete revelation, which is that 
the pursuit of happiness was not what I thought. It wasn't some substitute for, the, for property, but was this deep consensus of not only the right, but the responsibility to achieve virtuous self-mastery, self-reliance, character improvement, just to spend every day trying to be a better person. And that unlocked the connection I saw between government and politics and why they thought that personal self-government was necessary for political self-government. And I know we want to talk in a moment about what the implications for democracy were. But it was so satisfying, it makes me realize that despite the deep clashes between class and race and power, and I do agree with Heather that the great uh, political and constitutional debates in American history are all working out those initial debates between Hamilton and Jefferson about power. Was it we the people of the United States or of the individual states? Was it national government or states' rights? Was secession constitutional or not? These are the terms in which everything from the battle over slavery to the battle over equal rights for women and everything else are fought. But all within this framework, which is a common heritage for everyone, I just want to share because I'm, I feel like an evangelist for the virtues of deep reading. That was my takeaway from the whole experience. And just setting time in the morning for doing something which I've gotten out of the habit of doing, uh, which is two hours a day or so, just for reading for its own sake, was life-changing. And setting aside the device and not browsing or surfing and doing it at the same time every day it was a habit. And for the founders and the ancients, virtue is all about habits. And I'm really glad I got this. And I am sharing with you the radically liberating power of deep reading. So Heather, you explain in a section of your book on reclaiming America that our system of government, mainly the Constitution, was designed to adapt to new situations. Is that still possible? And are the values that Jeffrey has been so possessed, is it fair, my friend, to say that, <laughs> uh, by? Self-possessed. <laughs> Self-possessed. Can, can be part of the conversation that we're trying to have, not today, but in general, in the larger, more important context? So I would say yes. Um, but uh, would it be fair, do you think, to say that the pursuit of happiness is self-determination for the founders? That's a good word. Ken uses the phrase lifelong learning, but self-determination is a good way to put it. And, and probably more what they would use rather than lifelong well, learning. Yeah, I think that, that, that I, I'm taking it from the idea that it, if happiness is not the pursuit of objects in a marketplace of things, then what is it? Is it the pursuit of ideas in, a, you know, in that marketplace of ideas? And then what does that mean? It means constantly doing what he is doing every morning at dawn which is lifelong learning. So that's where I, I came to it. That's Well, that's kind of the, the business we're in, yeah. is lifelong learning. Yeah. But I wonder if they would have seen it more as, as, as the whole idea of being able to govern yourself as the idea of self-determination. I, I, Determining your future, choosing your fate. Cho choosing your fate, but, but within the context of the responsibility to improve yourself. I mean, it comes from actually Pythagoras, not Aristotle, but who knew that yes, the guy who right. invented the triangle and the harmonic system also was the great Greek moral philosopher who well, came up with Well, Leonardo's got them both covered because <laughs> he's doing science and art, and um, it, it's all there. And, and I think that I, my thing was aspirational, that, you know, a Adam said that I study war and politics, that my son may study, you know, commerce and industry, that my grandchildren might study art and music. I think I've, I've about balderized it a bit, but, but it, it was the idea of this more perfect thing in pursuit of the stuff. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, that's exactly right. It, and it's really significant. Quincy Adams, who's my hero yeah. out of all of them. He's the best. And he, his dad w said he wanted him to be able to do literature or music. And Quincy Adams said, if only I had some talent, I might have ended war and slavery. He set a very high bar for himself. Right. But he said what he really wanted to do was literature. He, he was most satisfied by his sonnets. And he's an example of someone who so mindfully lives the wisdom and he studies the classics. Uh, he turns to Cicero in times of great tragedy. His oldest son, George Washington Adams, commits suicide because he can't take the pressure of being John Adams' son. He goes into alcoholism. 
Quincy reinvents himself by spending a year reading Cicero, and then he becomes the greatest abolitionist of his age. And he fights against the gag rule, and he introduces a constitutional amendment to end slavery, and Frederick Douglass acclaims him. He casts his last vote on the floor of Congress against the Mexican War, dies before his colleagues, and his last words are, I am composed. That idea of self-composure, to use yeah. your phrase, self-determination, self-mastery, which he'd spent his whole life attempting to achieve. Let's, let's, let's go for the big finish now. Um, <laughs> obviously, we have a candidate for president today who I think it's fair to say, and he'd probably admit proudly himself, openly challenges democratic norms and ideas, more closely identifies with and emulates the world's most authoritarian leaders, both of today and the past, and has, as president and citizen candidate, created countless numbers of constitutional crises without precedent, without precedent. Again, don't take it from me. I think those are all things that he would not only agree with, but be proud of. Heather, can our democracy withstand another Trump term, or will he and the newly reconstituted Republican Party, born as you reminded us today in such unusual and positive and aspirational circumstances, uh, dismantle our democracy as we know it? I hear from so many people who feel hopeless and powerless. What can we do and what are the historical precedents we can find that give us hope and guidance? A small task. Uh, just a <laughs> tiny, so, just a tiny so. thing. We're gonna ask Heather now to save the Republic. Please pay oh. attention to this. Well, so, so, so let me just say one of the things I've noticed in, the, in writing lately speak directly to your book, and that is the emphasis on virtue. And what concerns me is Bill Barr, uh, former attorney general under Donald Trump, um, was out in front of the issue of virtue during Trump's term in which he said that human beings are naturally sinful, and therefore, in order to promote civic virtue, you need to impose religion on them. Mm. And this is a big argument in favor of destroying our democracy and imposing instead what is known as Christian nationalism. That's a political term. Christians, evangelical Christians, sometimes get very angry about it and says this is not Christian, uh, what, what these people want to do. And the answer to that is Christian nationalism is a political term in which the theocratic rules are imposed on the majority. So we're in a moment right now that looks, very, that is minority rule. We have a small group of people who are trying to impose their will on the rest of us. And the Republican Party is no longer even what it was in 2015. That Republican Party is dead. So is the traditional Republican Party. Instead, we have the Trump Party. And the Trump Party is funneling money to former President Donald Trump with the idea of putting him in power as a dictator. And they're very clear about this. I mean, one of the things that you can see if you go around this festival is the number of people talking about um, the, the fact that the news media does not seem to be covering in places that are not paywalled the actual plans for destroying our democracy because they do exist. Uh, they exist in the 2025 project, which has been written about, it's about 982 pages coming from the Heritage uh, Foundation and coming from 30 other, I think it's 29 other, I think it's total 30, uh, different organizations, right-wing organizations that we now know, thanks to an article that um, Casey Michael published yesterday, uh, is working very closely with Viktor Orban's Hungary, which shouldn't surprise anybody. The idea is to create a right-wing movement across the globe that will destroy pockets of democracy, and of course the United States is the leader in that. If you can undermine the United States, you've won. Aside from anything else, we're a very valuable piece of property. And I don't just mean the land, I mean everything that goes with the United States. So the stakes here are extraordinarily high. But are we done? No, no. The idea of human self-determination, the right to pursue happiness, is I think still fundamental to people in the United States of America. And I look at this moment not only as one of fright, you know, very frightening moment in which those people who are trying to destroy democracy have in fact locked up the Supreme Court and have in fact locked up the Senate and use those two things together essentially to destroy the ability of Congress to pass legislation any longer. That was Mitch McConnell's great contribution in quotation marks to our government. They have in fact 
put uh, the, a dictator, or somebody who wants to be a dictator in charge of one of what used to be a grand old party. They have sewn up a number of state Republican parties as well, and they're making inroads against the vote in, uh, through things like voter ID in a number of states. But the vast majority of Americans do not want this. And we have seen this happen before in our society when you get a minority taking over the nodes of democracy, insisting that they have, as the title of the 2025 project says, a mandate to rule the rest of us. Who gave them that mandate? You know, We have seen that repeatedly. And when that happened, the American people looked at each other and said, you know, we might not agree about immigration, and we might not agree about finances, and we might not agree about internal improvements, but by God, we can agree that we are all created equal, we have a right to a say in our government, and we have a right to human self-determination, which is, after all, the, the fundamental project of humanity. And when they have done that, they have not only taken back that government, they have created a period in which we have expanded liberal democracy and had extraordinary explosions of new art and new literature and new music and new housing, new governments, new ways of thinking about the world. And that, I think, is where we are right now. I will tell you, the 2028 election will not be a problem. The demographic changes in this country are such that this minority will not be able to control the country in 2028. But in order for there to be a 2028, there oh. has to be a 2024. And this is the election that our era needs to step up to the plate. And do I believe we'll do it? Yes. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I so, I, so, I so wanted a happy ending to this story, and Heather has provided, and I want to give the last word to, to Jeff. Jeff, you've studied and written extensively about the founders sort of trying to reverse engineer, like how do we keep an autocrat out of it? We are in the stages where we have the possibility that in a few months an autocrat could be taking over. Where, how do you respond to, to Heather's optimism? How do you respond to her peril and, uh, that she's described? And, and please help us leave uh, our conversation, which I thought there'd be time uh, for Q&A from all of you incredibly intelligent people, but I have two really smart people up here who I wasn't going to uh, uh, cut off. <laughs> Jeff. Well, the National Constitution Center is nonpartisan, so it's unconstitutional for me to have any political <laughs> opinions whatsoever. <laughs> but from a historical perspective, I can say confidently that January 6th was the founder's nightmare. And it's remarkable to see, you're nodding because you know it, Hamilton and Jefferson both predicting and warning against the danger of demagogues. Hamilton fears a Caesar who will be elected by a majority and then by flattering the people, persuade them to surrender liberty for cheap luxury. And he says, imagine in the future someone loose in morals and ambitious in temperament who flatters the people and reaps the whirlwind. And he wants to set up the whole constitution to avoid this eventuality. And then there's this amazing letter I found that Jefferson sends to Madison. He gets his first draft of the constitution and he says, I've got two objections. First, there's no Bill of Rights. And second, I'm afraid that we're going to have a demagogue in the future who will lose an election by a few votes, cry foul, refuse to leave office, enlist the states who voted for him, and install himself for life. So we have Ecclesiastes here. What has, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. I think all of you can imply from this these two extraordinarily articulate and erudite philosophers what has to happen. It's a simple elemental action that is possible because we are still citizens and not yet subjects. 
and that has to do with exercising the rights of that citizenship. May I please remind you that Jeff's latest book is The Pursuit of Happiness, How Classical Writers on Virtue Inspired the Lives of the Founders and Defined America, and Heather's latest book is Democracy Awakening, Notes on the State of America, and don't remember, don't forget her must-read newspaper, Letters from America, and they're gonna be signing books very shortly, I believe. Please give these two extraordinary human beings a big round of applause.